Hello, golf fans. Chris Terrell here with RotorPros.com to bring you another DFS PGA video. Before we get into this week's video, I want to tell you where you can find our content, and it starts over at RotorPros.com. Go to the homepage here. You're going to find our free content articles, uh, strategy articles, weekly articles, picks, and stuff like that. Uh, if you want access to our DFS cheat sheets as well as our Slack chat, you can come up and go over to the sign up button. We've got free trials going on either a three-day trial for a weekly membership or seven-day trial for a monthly or yearly membership. And that gets you access, like I said, to our DFS cheat sheets for PGA, NHL, NBA, NASCAR, UFC, EPL and UCL soccer, NFL, college sports, and we've even added tennis here recently as well. And it also gets you access into our Slack chat with channels for each and every sport. For PGA, I, me and Dane update the field every week. We update course information, um, weather throughout the week, past winners, top stats, key plays. There's a ton of information that goes on in Slack, so make sure to get it over there, rotopros.com, and sign up today. With that, let's jump into this week's video. Hello, golf fans. Welcome back to another DFS PGA preview video. This week, Dane and I will be breaking down the Valspar Championship, looking at the course, weather, key stats, DFS plays, top bets, one and dones, and much more. Dane, how's it going tonight, buddy? It's going good. Ready to dive back in um, after a week off, kind of, um, with uh, the two-man tournament last week. Um, it was one to kind of watch. That was kind of fun, but um, glad to be back to a normal stroke play event and get back in the groove of things as we lead up to a um, an interesting summer of golf PGA championship here in a few weeks. Um, so, yeah, ready to get back going. Yeah, and my local course opens up here in about two days, and the weather is looking just fancy. So I'm just really excited myself here. Big championships coming up for me. <laughs> no, yeah. but we were talking. <laughs> we were talking a little bit offline about the Zurich Classic, and uh, um, just kind of how much we take into account and put into weight statistically and narratively going forward of some of the stuff that was going there. And you had mentioned a little bit that um, look maybe at the guys that were were throwing birdies making a lot of birdies and stuff on the best ball days, especially um, myself. I, I think that's a great strategy and look at a little bit on the, on the opposite other, other side of things. I'm not really digging a player for a bad performance in these one-off unique events, kind of, kind of like your match play event or whatever. Um, it's nice to see players do well in these one-off events, but not necessarily a ding for guys that do bad in them. What is that kind of the way you're looking at it? Yeah, exactly. Um, kind of like, the match play and things like that. So, um, yeah, I'm like, like you said, I'm looking at people who made a lot of birdies on Thursday and Saturday when they were playing their own ball, um, on every hole. Um, and they were obviously being a little more aggressive than they normally would in a stroke play event, but, um, I'm glad to look at that to see guys that either continued form or found maybe just a little bit of form last week. Obviously we don't have the strokes gain stats, but, we can look back and see who was carrying the team per se. For yeah, those exactly. Students. Like day one there when Christopher Ventura was carrying the team. That was, yeah. that was awesome to watch. <laughs> Christopher. Was yeah. Case. Let's just say Sunday. I, I don't think he was carrying them when they were plus five or six. No, so. He was not. He definitely was not. <laughs> but I'm, I'm also glad that, that, uh, that event's over. It was a nice week off from, you know, making the sheet and updating things and, and playing and setting DFS lineups and that sort of thing. So it, it was a nice refresher and really back, uh, ready to get back in this week. So this week, PGA tour heads, uh, back to Florida for the Valspar championship. Like I said, in the opening, um, this event was canceled last year due to COVID-19 defending champ, Paul Casey, who's actually the back-to-back -back champion here. He won it in 2018 and 2019. Um, the event is 156 player field. The cut is back to top 65 and ties after the second round, which is Friday. I'm just going to flip over here and we're going to have a look at the sheet. Um, generally, what is your, I guess, initial thought in terms of the field when we're looking at the top here? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, no yeah, so I mean, looking at the top of the field, one thing I'm looking for with um, golfers this week, I mean, this course is one that's known for not hitting driver off every single tee for sure. Um, it's kind of a lot of stroke play or stroke play. I'm, I'm getting mixed up with the tournaments here, but <laughs> a lot of approach play yeah. um, that comes, <laughs> comes into it 
um, for guys who play well here. They've been good with their irons. Um, I think short game comes in around here. This is not one of the easier courses on tour, so you're not going to see – probably not going to see like a 20-under winner. I think last winners here have been 8, 10, 14, 7, right around that 10 to 15 uh, mark of under par. So it's kind of a mid-range as far as difficulty this week, um, which is good to see. Um, I like these kind of events that aren't just absolute birdie fest, but you're yeah. going to need to be striking the ball well um, and being able to get up and down if you do miss some of these greens. So um, as far as top of the field, I'll let you talk about um, what you're looking for in golfers. But the top of the field is pretty stacked this week with JT and DJ. Um, going to be interesting to see how they come back Um just kind of off a little bit of a layoff, Postmasters and things like that. Yep. Um, but Hovland played last week. 10-5 is a little steep for him. Um, I think if I was going to come all the way to 10K plus, I think I would go up top to um, JT at 11-5. I think – I mean, he's got decent history here, 2015-17, to 17, 10th, 18th, 93rd, which is not – um, up to his standards, but at least he's seen the course a few times. Um, so I think I would go all the way up to, to JT. And then second on that list for me would actually be Patrick Reed. I know Casey's won here back-to-back times that they had it in 18 and 19, but Patrick Reed, two second-place finishes in 18 and 15. Um, and I think he's kind of hungry this summer, I think, to get things going. So um, he fits this course. It's not – an overly long course off the tee. Like I mentioned, you don't need to bomb it. Um, so that kind of fits Reed a little bit as well. So 10-3 is fine for him too. So those are my two um, 10K and above. Nice. And you had mentioned the course. So just want to give a couple stats here about the course because it is a little unique. Um, Innisbrook Resort, Copperhead course, par 71, over 7,300 yards. So that seems a little bit long being that it's a par 71. Um, what makes it unique is there's five par threes and four of those par threes um, are over 200 yards. And then when you look at the par fours, there's only nine of them. F uh, three of them are over 500 yards and five more between 400 and 450. The par fives uh, are the four easiest holes in the course by far. 560 yards, 605, 575, and 590. But when you start looking at the scorecard here, and I've got it over here. And then we've got some course stats we'll look at here as well. Not one hole outside of those par fives played under par in the 2019 event. Um, really, really tough holes. The 16th hole rated out as the hardest. 18th, another par four, was the third hardest. So that closing stretch was first, eighth, and third ranked holes um, in terms of difficulty. And the course overall has ranked, I believe, inside the top 10 in five of the last six events here. And the other one, and that was four of those times, it was sixth or better. Um, in terms of difficulty ranking, and that includes the majors. So this is a very tough test. So I'm 100% with you in terms of ball striking. Um, overall, tee to green is going to be there as well. Like you said, the average greens and regulation and fairways hit has been around 55 to 58% for the field over the last five trips here. So you're going to need to hit fairways, and when you're not, I'm something I'm looking at as well. Just most of my weight is going to be on the tee to green stats, looking at your off the tee approach and around the green. Um, but I'm going to add in a few other things, par four scoring, obviously, because it's very difficult. I think you can set yourself apart with that par four scoring as well as rough proximity. If, if a lot of the field isn't going to be hitting, you know, the best players in the field, I believe last year there was only three players that hit over 70 or not last year, 2019, three players that hit over 70% fairways or greens in regulation. The year before that, 2018, there was only one player with over 70% GIR there. So ball striking is definitely going to get you ahead and par four scoring. So that's definitely what I'm looking at as well. Going into that top range, um, the guys that you mentioned, I am definitely, for my GPP builds for sure, I'm going a little bit more balanced in terms of uh, my cash lineup. Probably start with Paul Casey. Him is the fifth most expensive in the field, coming off back-to-back -back wins here at this event. I know it's they, they skipped last year, so it's been a couple of years. But he also ranks out well, well in my model when I'm looking at uh, strokes gain tee to green on difficult courses, uh, strokes gain tee to green in windy conditions because it looks like the early forecast is showing about 10 to 18 mile an hour winds, pretty much steady throughout the whole week. 
Yeah, that could change, but as of now, I'm not putting any splits into anything whatsoever in terms of day. We'll look at that a little bit more on Wednesday, but I'm generally looking at guys that are a little bit better in the wind. We're not going to see the extreme winds or anything like that, but when we get in the 15 to 18 mile an hour range, that definitely affects things, so I will look at that as well. So Casey stands out in that fashion as well. And then, of course, Corey Connors. Now, I want to first of all talk about the betting market because it just seems crazy that Corey Connors' number at 20 to 1 is smaller than Paul Casey at 22. So for that reason alone, I'll be betting Paul Casey outright as well as playing him in DFS. But in DFS, getting Corey Connors, I know it seems a little expensive, but 9,600 in this field, his ball striking has been absolutely amazing um, lately. And what really gets me is that he's been working on his putting, and I believe he has gained strokes putting in five or six events straight in terms of the shot tracker events that track it. Uh, we don't have that for the Masters, but sorry, four straight and five of his last six events. So I, I wanted to get your take in this top tier. I know you like those other guys there, but what do you think of Connors? He's got some experience here as well. Yeah, I love Connors um, this week. And, and if you compare his betting odds to um, his DFS price, I'm definitely fine paying 9-6. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about betting him at 20 so it's like yeah. the books almost know something or i don't know i mean right. he's been playing great i mean his last five events top 15s at every um start obviously very trending very well he's always been good tee to green getting that putter going a little bit this is the kind of course that sets up well for him too so yeah i love Corey connors um this week he's kind of the the one that i like in that top um of the 9k range yeah. Um, from there, I like dropping down to right at right around nine, and then just below it. So Russell Henley um, is one for me that I Love like. Um, ninth here in 2017, been playing very well really since last year um, when the restart um, happened. So he's one that I really like, um, and another one that I think is going to be kind of mixed feelings about across the industry this week is Rose at, at 8800. Um, you kind of seen him strike a little bit of form when he at the Masters last time out. Um, as far as a, a normal stroke play event, he played last week with Stinson, and they look pretty good. Um, so maybe he's found a little something. I think he's back working with his coach um, that they split from a, a little bit um, last year. Um, so I think Rose, 8,800, still a fair price for him. So I'm going to be playing him as well. Um, and I haven't made my mind yet, um, mind up yet on Neiman at, at 9,100. Um, it honestly <laughs> seems a little bit steep to me, which is saying something. Um, so I'm not made my decision there yet. Well, that's, that's an interesting range to be honest with you. And you started off with Russell Henley. I absolutely love it. Um, he was one of my early outright bets. We'll talk about our bets, uh, closer to the end here a little bit, but, uh, what stood out with me is that 9k price tag. The form coming in off back-to-back -back top 10s. He's got some experience here. T42 in 2019, uh, top 10 in 2017. I believe 2016 was, he made the cut with the T71. That's back when the cut was uh, T70. Um, so I believe that was a, he's made the cut in all three trips. But then I started looking at the difficult condition narrative, the windy narrative, and he is, I believe, top three. I posted it in chat earlier. I'm just going to bring that up. I mentioned there was five players in my model looking at the last 24 rounds. Uh, this is using Fantasy National. So I looked at last 24 rounds, Tita Green with windy conditions and the last 24 rounds in difficult scoring conditions and just kind of put a 50% weight on both of them. I just kind of wanted to see. Henley was number one um, in difficult conditions, third and windy. Uh, Justin Thomas was second in both. Uh, Casey was third and sixth. Scheffler was sixth and first and Eric Van Ruyen was uh, ninth and fourth. Those were the five players that ranked top 10 in both of those categories. So uh, definitely like Henley at 9K. I think you could easily build a core if you wanted to just go off those narratives alone. Um, I'm going to have a bunch in my 20 max, probably at least six cores or seven uh, right around that uh, Henley and Casey build. But you mentioned Justin Rose. I think that's going to be, honestly, when we come Wednesday and start breaking down some ownership projections, I think he's going to be lower owned. You've got Henley right above him. Um, you've got Jason Kokrak right there, who I think is going to be probably top three to five in ownership this week. I like it. He's got top tens here in his last two trips to this course. He has got top 15s in four of his last six trips, made the cut in five of those six trips. 
and he's coming in with good form too. T49 wasn't the greatest of showings at the Masters before that. He had three straight top 10. So I think he's going to take a lot of ownership. And I normally like to pivot off these guys. I might make a separate build here again this week because I really do like Kokrak at this price in this event. Um, your thoughts on him? Yeah, I mean, good form in general and good form here. Um, uh, back Enough. in 19th, <laughs> second, eighth. I mean, yep. That was, I don't even think he was the same golfer that he is right now back then. So, um, awesome. as far as consistency wise, is what he's been playing lately. So, yeah, he's going to be popular, but, but a good play for sure. And then going down to the bottom of the 8K range um, from the top there, I, I'm just skipping all the way down. And one player who I think, just because a lot of people look at course history, I think a lot of people might, or at least the ownership on him, Chris Kirk, I'm talking about. Uh, we've been on him, or at least I've been on him for, it seems like, since the start of the year. Um, and it's been a good run for him. Like, playing him cash almost every single week um, has been great. And 8200 the price is getting up there. And I get it. He's made the cut in two of his last four trips, but he's missed the cut badly in three of five trips here, going back to 2011. I think that might get some people off of him going up to Kokrak or down to, you know, even Keegan Bradley, Sam Burns, um, who else do we got down here? Lucas Glover going down into the top of that 7K range. I think Kirk is going to be a little bit lower owned, and I like it. And I'm not really worried about his ownership for cash games because dude has been playing awesome. Um, he's gained strokes off the tee in six straight. He's gained strokes um, on approach in five of the last six. And he's just he's just on a really good run. Top tens and back-to-back -back events. Made the cut in five straight, or six straight, sorry. Um, so I'm definitely got him in my cash build. And if it looks like he's going to be low and I'm definitely going to be about double the field on him and GPP as well, I think. Yeah. I haven't decided on him fully at, for, for GPPs at least. Um, I think I do like a couple more. Um, I mean, he's got upside. I, I don't want to say you don't have upside with the way he's been playing. Um, but I do like the full upside of a couple guys around him a little bit more. Um, but uh, I would sign up right now for a top 10 from him, which is very possible at 8,200. Um, obviously, you said maybe the course history will keep him a little lower on than he has been. So that'll be something interesting to watch come Wednesday um, evening for sure. Um, you mentioned Keegan Bradley. Um, I think he's going to be one of my uh, favorites in, right around this range this week. Um, he's just a, a decent putting week away from – uh, really contending in one of these events, 7900 is a fine price for him too. Um, we want ball strikers here. So Keegan's not a guy I usually go to, but I'm fine playing him. He's actually not been putting horrible no. um, over his last four events. He had one that he lost. He gained strokes in three of four. So um, that's, that's positive interesting for him. to see. Yeah, that's, that's very unheard of for him. I think he'd lost in about eight straight before that, maybe nine. Um, but maybe he's turned the corner. If he's flat putting, that's what we want. So um, if he's anywhere positive, he's going to crush for the week, I would think. So Keegan's one of my favorites there. Before you go um, past have... Keegan, before you go past Keegan, he hasn't gained strokes putting in three of four events since June of 2017. I just thought I'd throw that in there. So this is big for him. This is really big. And after yeah. he after he did that, that led to back-to-back uh, -to -back top 10 finishes. So, I mean, I'm just saying he only needs a top 25, so I think that's a good floor for cash. And I think he's got top right. 10 side if he can gain a stroke or two. So uh, I'll let you go on with the mid, that mid-K range again. Yeah, I'm definitely in on Keegan this week. Um, Kevin Na is interesting. He does have a second and a tenth here in 14 and 15. He's kind of been all over the place as far as form, though. Um, yeah. So I'm not really sure what I want him. You could sprinkle him in in the 20 max build. Um, not one of my favorites for sure. Actually, there there's one. I, I've really not figured out what I want to do with the rest of this upper seven range. When I get down to the mid range, there's a guy that I have – um, I, on that I don't think many are going to play at, at 7,400. So I'll let you leave the rest of the upper sevens to you. Maybe you can convince me on a couple guys. But Sam Horsfield, I think, is interesting to me for GPPs. This guy has been crushing it on the European tour. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I'll have to look it up that he played college golf in Florida. Um, 
I'll have to confirm that in just a minute. But his since the turn, um, last four events on the European Tour, fourth, fifteenth, third, eighth, um, he's up there on tour, on tour in strokes gained approach, all the tee to green stats. Um, so, so Horsefield's definitely going to be one that Florida I'm going to play this week. So, so he's a Gator. Yeah, I thought he, I thought he played down there. So I'm sorry if he's that's coming not back the Gator. over. He just. <laughs> I just did the like the gator chomp. I don't know if that's the Florida Gator thing. I might have got that wrong. It is. I'm, okay, it good. Is. I don't feel as bad now. <laughs> we can ask Mike, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I know he's I know he's a gator. Um, but yeah, I mean, seventy four hundred is a fine price for him. Obviously, he plays most of his golf on the European tour, but this guy has been absolutely on fire um for this whole year. So I'm definitely fine going uh, to Horsefield uh, at 7,400 in an event that maybe he's familiar with, with Florida golf. Um, I know he just played last week overseas, so he, he's got to be traveling, but um, that don't bother me a bit at this price. No, I'm just trying to dig up his uh, strokes gain stats over on that tour. Just really wanted to. Yeah, have I had it. Um, let's see. Strokes gain off so the strokes gain approach. He's he. I think ranks twelfth. Oh wow. Um, yeah. Look. Yeah. At strokes gain approach over sixteen rounds, four events on tour in twenty twenty one. He's averaging one point one five strokes gain per round. Twelfth on the European tour. Um, strokes gain T to green. He is. Um, 18th on tour, averaging oh. 1.69 strokes gain uh, per round there. And he's actually not negative strokes gained around the green, which I think uh, when he came out of college and was first um, kind of on the scene that that was where he struggled. And he's actually positive there, not one of the top on tour, but he's plus 0.2 um, around the green um, over those four events as well in this calendar year. So he's kind of firing on all parts of his game. So. Um, yeah, I really like him this week. Awesome. Myself in that 7K range, there's a couple guys that I like. Doug Gim's one of them for sure. We've been getting him in uh, you know, a high six, mid 6K range. It, it's surprising that his price has taken this long to come up. The, I mean, you look at last year, it was kind of a disaster how many cuts he missed. He came into this year and he's just been firing on all cylinders. Like the approach game is absolutely insane. I believe it's nine straight. He's gained strokes. He's gained three or more strokes in three of his last four events. Um, the off the tee game has been there very consistently. So tee to green, he's been awesome. Um, the putting is what lets him down. But even in these events where he's he's lost seven and a half strokes putting at the Valero and still finished T44, he missed the cut at the Honda, um, losing 4.1 strokes. But those two are kind of outliers. Usually if he's losing strokes, it's like half a stroke or one, one to one and a half stroke, something like that. So from that price tag, just I think we can go cash games if you want to pay up for some guys because, like, overall, he's been consistent. When he's making the cuts, he, he's top 30, top 25, and he got upside of top 10. He had a T5 at the Amex uh, where he gained 5.8 strokes T to green, and overall he's gained five plus, or four and a half strokes T to green in five of his last eight events. So he's been going at that, and, and at that price, I definitely like it. And then Denny McCarthy stands out as well. I think he's going to take some ownership. He had a top 10 here in 2019 in his first trip. That was really nice to see. Um, and he's coming in off of a T13, T34, and T3. And those were at the RBC Heritage, Valero, and Honda. So he's he's really trending in form. He does have that one appearance here, so he has played here. And then even looking at, um, you know, the difficult course conditions, stuff like that, he is inside the, I think he's inside the top 40 in terms of difficulty and windy conditions. So I, I definitely like to see that as well. So definitely on Denny McCarthy in that mid seven K range. And those are, those are my two favorite in that range for sure. Yeah. There's a lot of name value in that upper seven range that I think might at least if it doesn't concentrate on one guy up there, um, I think it'll accumulate quite a bit of ownership from yep. like Sam Burns um, all the way down, even to really to Van Ruyen, all the way down to all those, Strillman, Woodland, Glover, Kisner, um, Howe, Grace, Hadwin, all those guys are going to get a little bit of ownership. So I think this range overall is going to be spread out um, on Wednesday night when we look at projected ownership. 
I think personally, uh, maybe I'm just thinking cash game mindset here, but people looking at course history, I think Glover and Burns just because of uh, obviously Burns T12, T30 and his two trips here and Glover T13, T18 and two of his last three trips here both have form as well. I think they're going to be the highest owned in that range. So I, but I, I'm with you that Woodland's going to take some ownership. I think even Kistner's going to take some ownership, although his form has been just terrible outside of the, the, the match play. <laughs> um, Keegan Bradley <laughs> yeah. up there as well. Um, so I think, yeah, some of the guys, I think come Wednesday, we are going to find a few of these guys that will come low owned. But um, even if they don't come low owned, like you said, it's going to be spread out enough where one guy isn't going to be 15 to 18% in this range. Um, and that's kind of the range when we start talking these mid 7K range to high 7K, even the guys in the 6K range. This is the this is where if we see a guy projected for 15 to 20%, that's where I really start considering fading um, and looking for those pivots. So we'll just have to wait till Wednesday night and see where that shakes out. This is definitely the range where that's going to matter the most to me to where I'm going to have the most exposure to. Um, so we'll look at that on Wednesday. Is there any guys kind of, you know, we'll call them like if you're going stars and scrubs, the low 7K down into that 6K range that you're looking at? Yeah, there's one guy that stands out um, right now early in the week, and it's uh, Keith Mitchell. Uh, um, he's kind of been a guy in the past that played really well in Florida, um, and it looked like he found a little bit of form at Valero um, with a 17th um, gain strokes everywhere except lost point three around the green. Um, so maybe he found a little bit of something there, um, and 7000 is a fine price for him. He was 11th here. Um, back in 2017, uh, when he was kind of finding a lot, quite a bit of form back then. Um, so I'm, I'll take a shot on Keith Mitchell down there this week. Other than that, there's a lot of course history narratives you could could walk in into down there. If, if you think Stinson found a little bit of something last week, I, I mean they they look decent as a team, but it's one of just one of those things you might need to dig in a little bit more and see how he played specifically on the two days with Rose. Um, Schwartzel was another one that looked decent last week. Um, obviously they were right in it till the end, him and Louie. Um, and he's actually won here back in 16. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think he'll be super high on this week. And I don't know that I'm in on him at all. Um, it's a lot of more digging that I want to do um, before I make any rash decisions down here this week for sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, one guy that I I uh, really kind of find interesting in my Stars and Scrubs build, and I almost consider him for cash games, but I'm definitely not going that route now that I've built some lineups, is Roger Sloan at <laughs> 6,500, 250 to 1 odds. Um, what I like is he's played here once. He made the cut, T60, nothing great. But, I mean, from a guy in this range, making the cut is about about what we're looking for as a floor. If they can get us a top 25, that's, you know, definitely exceeding value. You're putting up 10x to 15x value by getting a top 25 in these events. Um, what I like most is his form. He's got uh, top 25 finishes in three of his last four events. And in this field, um, he ranks 19th in strokes gained approach and 18th in strokes gained T to green overall. Um, over the last 24 rounds coming in. So the form is definitely there. He's got experience at this course, and he's 6,500. So like in a 20 max build, I'm only looking at maybe, I think having him in two to three lineups is going to be more than the field. Um, if you go four, you're going to probably double the field. Um, I definitely like that. If he makes the cut, like I said, you're, you're it's not going to kill your lineup. And if he puts in a top 25 T, somewhere between, say, a top 20, uh, or a T20 and a T30 somewhere in there, I think he's he's crushing his value at 10X. So that's one guy I'll be looking at in my builds. He's the first one that stood out to me. But like you said, I'm definitely going to be looking in a little bit further into these guys digging in. Like Brian Stewart um, is one that kind of pops off right away. Just going to throw a few out here that stand out. He's got uh, T18 here in 2019, T38 in 2017. So he's got some decent course history mixed in. He's coming off, you know, absolutely terrible form but a T18 in his last event. So he might've found something coming into an event he's familiar with. Ryan Armour's another one down here. It's got good course history. So just kind of looking at this course history and all the green in this 6K range just tells you that we're going to get probably, I don't know, four or five of these guys that pop off at this event um, down in this range. So when you see the GPP winning lineups, you know, come Sunday and all those guys inside the top 10 of the big GPPs, 
you're probably going to see a bunch of these mid 6k guys so this is a range we're definitely going to want to dig into so um definitely hit us up in chat um check our cores out by the end of the week we're going to have rankings up we, we rank our top three to five players in every price range on the sheet as well for the members as well as on wednesday we're going to try and do a live show uh, both of us one of us we're not not sure yet but we've got weather um, that we definitely want to discuss ownership projections and that sort of thing so there's a lot more coming down the rest of this week before we take off here dane anything else you that we maybe uh, didn't touch on that you wanted to mention uh, what about Chase Kepka down at 6,200? Oh, the other Kepka. So if we got a brink truck. <laughs> um, I mean, he was 30th at the Honda last month. So it's not like he was completely out of form or anything. He went to college down in South Florida um, as well. So he's getting his opportunity uh, down here in the state. Um, played decent at the Honda. So maybe he's worth a GPP flyer down there at um, 60 or 6,000. I said 6,200, $6,000 men price chase Kepka. Okay. Do you know what stood out the most out of those two events? T T 26, the three M open. Um, that was back in 2020. So that's, that's some old, and around old the green. Form. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't even think about yeah. him. So, uh, definitely be looking into him and I mean, you could put him in one or two, he's going to be like 1%. Uh, half yeah. a percent so <laughs> that's uh that's a great gpp flyer you can really start stacking if you were to go two guys in the 6k range when you're building gpp lineups you can most definitely go up here in this 9k up range and get two guys easily in your core of your lineups mm -hmm. and probably another guy in the 8k range so that's i love it for gpp going down in that range and playing that grabbing two of them um we see a lot of those winning lineups sometimes in the stars and scrubs build that make it to the top when you see justin thomas win or dj um, or, you know, we see Reed, Casey, you know, any two or, or three of those guys up in the leaderboard on Sunday, those are the builds when we see multiple guys in the DFS winning lineups um, from that 6K range. So I definitely like that. Myself for cash games, like I said, just to uh, wrap up here, I'm either going to be starting out with like Paul Casey, uh, probably Corey Connors for sure, 9,600. You know, the, like we said, the, the odds to DK ranking there just makes sense for that. And then I'm probably going to head down and look at like Henley, and coke rack those are kind of my three four core guys that i like for cash games this week and like i said uh stay tuned on wednesday we'll be talking weather ownership projections if we can't get on to the live show we'll be talking about it in, in chat as well so thanks for joining us uh, make sure to like the video subscribe to the channel and and uh, you can also throw any questions down there below oh also can get reach us on twitter at jaeger underscore bombs nine and what's your handle dane you're on mute, so no one even. I'm can't muted. Even it's, hear red, it. it's red stack <laughs> 007. It's the end of the show. No one's watching or paying attention at the end, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But yeah, hit us up on Twitter. Um, what was your handle there? It's red stack uh, 007. Right on. That sounds good. Thanks a lot, everyone. Good luck this week.